Neither the El Paso County Medical Society, its members, nor KCUS-TV shall be responsible for the views, opinions, or facts expressed by the panelists on this television program. Please consult your doctor. Good evening. Tonight's show talks about all kinds of strokes in all kinds of people, not just those who are at high risk. We are specifically going to talk about some major treatment successes and advancements this evening. During the show, we have experts answering your questions about strokes and some strategies that can save lives. And as you know, this is a live show, so give us a call with your questions, and uh, you can telephone us at 881-0013. You can also ask your questions via tablet or computer or phone, because we are streaming live on Facebook and all you have to do is go to the search engine and go to Case US TV um, and we will show up there again we're streaming live and this will be on a couple more times throughout the evening this evening's program is underwritten by University Medical Center and we also want to thank the Texas Tech Paul L Foster School of Medicine for providing the medical students to man our phones with us this evening we have two fourth year medical students, one that has already started her fourth year and one that's starting their fourth year in July. So that's a pretty big deal. We have Janice Maliaco with us and we also have Teresa Smith. So thank you so much for taking some time out and being here this evening. And these are the young ladies who are gonna be answering the telephones and taking down your questions and bringing them here to the doctors. I also wanna say a huge thank you to the El Paso County Medical Society who's been sponsoring this show for over 22 years. I'm I'm Katherine Berg, and you're watching The El Paso Physician. Thanks again for joining us this evening. We're going to talk all about strokes, but the cool thing is we're talking about successes and advancements. So all the stuff that's happening now and what's happening in the near future when it comes to treating strokes. We've got three doctors with really, really big titles. And I love this because it, it really kind of defines who you are. I like that a lot. We have Dr. Salvador Cruz Flores, and he goes by Dr. Salvador Cruz. And he also has a master's in public health as well. He's a chief of neurology and director of neurosciences intensive care unit at the University Medical Center and he's also professor and chair of neurology at Texas Tech. Then we have Dr. Anatha Veleporam and uh, he goes by Dr. Veli. God bless you. And Dr. <laughs> Veli is a staff neurologist and he works with uh, neurosciences intensive care and stroke patients at the University Medical Center and is an assistant professor of neurology at Texas Tech. And then we have Dr. Gustavo Jose Rodriguez, and he is the interventional neurologist at the Medical Center at University Medical Center, and also an associate professor and vice chair of neurology at Texas Tech. <sighs> now, what does all that mean? That's really the question to the audience. So this is what we get. It's like when you go to uh, some kind of a function and there's the bio and it's three pages long. And the guy gets up there and says, this is really what I do. So translated to Dr. Cruz, this is really what I do. If you can explain to the audience what that would be. <laughs> uh, long story or short story? Short story. Because <laughs> we're going to go into uh, the long uh, story later anyway. Uh, uh, three functions mainly, okay. uh, uh, about 60% uh, of the time I take care of patients in the hospital, mostly neurology patients, uh, general neurology patients, patients with stroke and patients uh, critically ill in the neuro ICU, but the intensive care unit. The second role, which is my chair uh, uh, hat, is, uh, is administrative role in terms of uh, directing uh, the service of neurology in the hospital and and the academic side on Texas Tech as, as chair of neurology, trying to grow the service. And, uh, and uh, the last uh, uh, part of my job is to teach I mean mm. medical students and, and residents, uh, et cetera. So that's uh, sort of a, in a nutshell what I do. In a nutshell. I like that. And I, is, is the teaching your most favorite part? Actually, it's the combination of all of it. Okay. I mean, I, I Good I, answer. I, I, You're yeah. so diplomatic. I like that. Love is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, uh, what makes it fun is, is uh, be able to do all three. three nice. Things. Yeah. That makes sense to me, actually. Dr. Veli, how about you? You're the one on the show that has never been here before. <laughs> yes. And I want you to look at his teeth and his eyes because he was asking about this. I know you at home can't see it, but <laughs> there is this light that's shining in his eyes. And he's like, is that light just for me? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just for you, buddy. <laughs> um, so but I it's, it's to fill in all those nice little spaces inside the face. But Dr. Veli, what do you do all day every so day? I'm a neurologist, and uh, by training, I subspecialize in neurocritical care. I'm a neurointensivist. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I take care of critically ill neuro neurology patients admitted in the ICU. Okay. Uh, I'm at the same time, I'm an assistant professor at Texas Tech. So I teach residents, I teach medical students. Uh, at the same time, because it's a teaching institution, I teach the nurses or nurse practitioners. And at the same time, we teach the patients too and their families. I love that you said that. You teach the patients and their families. And we all need a little bit more of that. So thank you for including that. I appreciate that. Dr. Rodriguez, you're the intervention guy. So how would you explain that to everybody at home? Well, it's pretty much um, uh, these procedures that are um, intended to um, help patients with stroke, either hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic stroke. I'm sure we'll talk about those later. Mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty much the, the plumbers of the, of the brain. If, if there is a, a pipe that is, uh, needs to be occluded, we go there. And if there is a blockage in an artery in, a, in the brain, we go there and we try to open it up. Uh, different ways, uh, different methods. Um, and um, I do teaching as well mm -hmm. uh, in research. That's my academic part of uh, my profession. And um, I like education as well. Um, nurses, uh, uh, students, physicians, uh, that's pretty much. And that's what's so nice because we have different sponsors or different underwriters for the program uh, throughout the years. And I'd like to focus a little bit on UMC because all three of you also within what you do every day, you have a teaching role. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cruz, I'd like for you just to kind of take that away for a moment because that's such a unique way to practice because not everybody gets to do that. Not every doctor gets to do that. In fact, very few get to do that. So maybe talk a little bit about UMC's role in the area of practicing but also teaching. Well, the uh, University Medical Center, uh, it, they, it has a specific uh, a, a place, if you will, uh, and relationship with, with Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is the main site for training and education for medical students and for residents doing subspecialty. And so it's a, it, it is a center where uh, most patients are going to be treated and, and, and be seen by, by large teams of, of people, any specialty, internal medicine, surgery, uh, whichever the specialty it is, mm -hmm. the patient is going to get seen by uh, five or six people in the team. The, uh, the team is usually composed by uh, anywhere between two and five medical students, and then uh, you may have two or three residents, and then you have the attending physicians that direct care. Mm -hmm. And so a, 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 as, a, as a teacher and educator, is a, a, I think the benefit of it is that uh, uh, you force in a way to keep up with uh, the science and w and and then you got to be on your toes be because yeah. re the residents and the uh, the the, res the trainees and the, the medical <coughs> students really keep you on the on your toes. Mm. Although, I mean, with 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 the the years and after being, uh, I mean, having done this for the better part of almost thirty years, uh, uh, you start learning to say when you don't know. I mean, so the, the, the beauty is that you learn to say, I don't know, let's, let's go and look it let's up all of us. Let's figure it out, yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. So it's, uh, a, that's sort of, but I mean, teaching goes on every day uh, with every patient uh, as, as we go walk around uh, through the rooms. And human beings can learn a lot from that. I don't know, let's go figure it out instead of just making something up. I love that. Well, the, the, the word doctor uh, 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 comes from uh, a means, a uh, teacher, actually. Yes. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. The things that I learn, mm -hmm. doctor means teacher. So, uh, Teacher Veli, um, <laughs> if you could describe, and I know this seems very basic as a question, but what is happening when somebody has a stroke? And I know there's different types of strokes. Yes. Um, so I guess as, as basic as you can say that, and then we will go into the two different types, of th the main two different ty types of strokes, and then going forward from there. So stroke happens when there is disruption of blood flow to the brain. And this disruption could be a clot, mm -hmm. which blocks the blood vessel, or it could be the rupture of the blood vessel itself and it bleeds into the brain. And that is the simplest way to put what you mean by stroke. Okay. Um, so let's take the one that is a clot. And now, um, and I know Dr. Rodriguez, we're gonna kind of bounce back and forth, but so let's take, and that would be an ischemic yes. stroke? Yes. If. Go ahead, sorry. If this, if there is a stroke which is caused by a clot blocking the artery, mm -hmm. we term it as ischemic stroke. If there is a rupture of blood vessel, then we call it as a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. And Dr. Rodriguez, as the intervention doc, um, there is, so there's a point, and again, this is kind of in the very beginning. Something is happening to mom. 
she's slurring speech, there's something off, we're calling the ambulance. So how does one diagnose what is happening to mom? She's in the ambulance, we're going to the hospital, what are you looking for in figuring out what type of a stroke, if it's, number one, <coughs> if it's a stroke, type <coughs> of stroke, et cetera. Right, so there's, there are symptoms, um, signs and symptoms that are classic or typical of stroke, like a slurred speech or usually um, lack of proper mo motor strength in one side of the body. Um, those are the m classic or, or um, uh, lack of sensation on one part of the body and that points to a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, that tells you that, uh, especially if it, if it happens suddenly, all of a sudden, that tells you it's vascular and it's happening in the brain. Um, then, unfortunately, clinically, you cannot tell the difference between the two. So you need to take that patient to an, a place where there is uh, imaging, mm -hmm. neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. um, in some cities, there are ambulances that carry a CT and they can picture the that. brain okay. and tell the difference whether we're dealing with a hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. But in most places... And there's an image machine in the ambulance there itself. There is, yeah. Goodness, okay. Uh, but m most places you have to take the patient to a hospital that has that capability um, and imaging is done and, and then you, you, can, you can tell what's going on. Okay. So on that point, Dr. Cruz, let's talk about the imaging. Is the imaging a CAT scan? Is it an MRI? Does it differ? They, they differ. Both, okay. have, uh, both have their uh, usefulness. Mm -hmm. a, the importance of, uh, uh, of recognizing or identifying with ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke is that the treatment is different. Okay. Uh, whatever we do for the ischemic stroke can actually harm the hemorrhagic stroke and the other way around. And so it is, we can, uh, at the bedside, we can make an educated guess about what is the most likely ischemic mm -hmm. or hemorrhagic, but at the end of the day, we're always going to need at least a CT scan. At least, uh, okay. To, to, to be able to say this is, n this is not a hemorrhage, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, it's probably a, an ischemic stroke early on usually doesn't show up. You don't even see it. Uh, hmm. But if a person is having symptoms of, st of, of, of a stroke, let's say, right, well, weakness in one side with, uh, with impairments of speech, uh, you do a scan and the scan looks normal uh, or you don't see anything. That, that is uh, an uh, a sign that tells you this is probably an ischemic stroke because it happened within the past hour or two hours, whatever. Okay. A, the, the ischemic changes in the brain don't show up for a few hours. Uh, they can show up as early as uh, three hours sometimes. Uh, depend if it is very extensive or it can take as, as long as 24 hours if we're talking about a CT scan. You can see faster, with an MRI, you can see faster th those changes if there was okay. an ischemic stroke. Okay. However, the, the MRI may not be readily available all the time as the scan is. And so what, what you really need to know mm -hmm. uh, 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 acutely, uh, you can actually get it with, uh, with an ischemic stroke, uh, with a CT scan. Okay. But what you really need is to make sure that there is not a hemorrhage. Right. Because if it's not a hemorrhage, the hemorrhage looks like a, a, a white, a, a, a big bl white spot in the brain. Okay. If there is no hemorrhage in the scan, and then you can assume there is an ischemic stroke. Mm -hmm. There is another procedure that goes with the CT scan, plain CT scan, which is giving uh, the person uh, a, a, cont a contrast or dye through the mm -hmm. vein. Mm -hmm. that, uh, th the scan is also capable with the dye in the vein to actually uh, image the, the blood vessels. We can actually see the blood vessels in the neck and, the, and, and, and in the head. Okay. And so if, if this was an ischemic stroke and the person has a, a large blood vessel that is occluded, we, on, on the one hand, the scan tells us whether it's a hemorrhage or not. If it is not, and we don't see changes, then the, what we call the CTA or CT angiography, which is the dye that let us look at the blood vessels, we can identify where the occlusion is. Okay. And then, depending on where in time the person is, mm -hmm. th then we, one can decide what type of treatment is uh, the patient best suited for, either uh, a, uh, what we call thrombolysis intra intravenously, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, I'm just going to uh, give you the, the analogy, like Drano, mm -hmm. uh, for, like for, for, uh, like right. Drano for, for the pipe. Right. Uh, and then uh, we can start that medication uh, relatively safely, if at least we know that the person, uh, if the patient is within a certain window, of, uh, and I'll let them talk ab more about the mm -hmm. window. Mm -hmm. And then I if the person is still within that window and, and there is a large vessel that we can see in the CTA that is uh, blocked off, we know that the, the drano is not always effective, like it's not always effective in right. our pipes. Right. And sometimes then you go to the, what, uh, wh what happens when you have an occluded pipe and who do you call? 
the rotor rule, mm -hmm. right? That's what I was going to say that, Ghostbusters. That, yeah, that, yeah, no, you're gonna, yeah, you call yeah. the rotor rules. Right. And, so, and, and that's what he does. Go, okay. Goes with the catheter inside the blood vessel mm -hmm. uh, all the way, navigates the, 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 the catheter until he gets to where the occlusion is and he can actually fish out the clot. And right. I'm going to have you, Dr. Ru Rodriguez, in a little bit actually physically explain what you're doing during that process. Uh, Dr. Velli, if you could, and this is, this is where it gets tricky, I understand just by doing this program for a while, sometimes the person having the stroke doesn't realize they're having the stroke. Um, and I'd love for you to explain, and to the audience, think about maybe two or three people sitting around the TV or around the computer or around the phone because they're waiting in line to get into the restaurant. Um, but what is, and I know we were looking for maybe slurring when part of your body is not doing very well. Some people might think, oh, I'm just tired. Or even with you said with the CAT scan, sometimes you can't see anything specific for several hours. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Veli, about time. How yeah. important is time? And what are you looking for to know, I need to go now? Or maybe I'm just tired, I'm going to lay down. Or maybe, et cetera, et cetera. You know where I'm going with on yes. that. Yes. So one simple sentence, mm -hmm. time is brain. Time okay. is brain. Yes. OK. And you'll be surprised that in one minute, you lose about 20, about 2 million neurons in the brain if okay. your blood vessel is blocked. So time is the essence. Mm -hmm. The sooner you get to the hospital, you get the clot busting medication, the chances of you getting better is more. Mm -hmm. So if you are delaying by 30 minutes, you, you will lose about 10% of the chance of, a, of having a functional independence. So about 30 minutes. About it could 30 happen minutes. In just about 30 minutes, okay. So that is very important. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people may think, like, oh, my hand is heavy. Probably I lifted something. I mean, they may just sit for a day and they come back because it was, it's not getting better. Right. And sometimes people even don't know. I mean, uh, Yesterday, I saw a patient, I mean, he didn't know that he was actually was unable to see his right side of the vision mm. because our brain centers are wired in a way that our eye is actually, the vision is controlled by both sides. So he was unaware that he couldn't see on the right side. He kept bumping into things hmm. and he came into the hospital because he had headache, so it, the patient couldn't uh, get over the headache. And we, when we scanned him, he actually had stroke. And even and in my- And it was an ischemic stroke, so it was a yes. clot in his situation? Okay. Yes. So okay. the thing is that that can happen even with hemorrhage too. Mm -hmm. I mean, our brain is mapped in a way that we, certain functions are carried out by certain uh, parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people may have problems getting words out. And for example, if it's a lawyer who cannot just get, but he could function, right. he can move, there is no weakness, there is no weakness in the legs, he can walk properly. But the only thing is that he's unable to get the words. He knows in his brain, but he couldn't articulate. Mm -hmm. That itself is like a disabling thing for him. Mm -hmm. He can lose his job and that could be a stress on the family. Right. So if there is a doubt, that's what I tell. Don't think about it. Just come to the hospital, right. get checked out. Agreed. Uh, nicely said. Dr. Rodriguez, I'd like to, I'm going to focus on ischemic for just a little while, and then I really want to focus on uh, the brain bleed, as mm -hmm. people call it as well. So <coughs> you as the in interventionist, so you now have somebody that's coming into the hospital, and we know that it's an ischemic stroke. There's a clot, and you're able to see it through the MRI. How, how do you go in through the body? Do you go in through the neck? Do you, go, do you drill a hole in the head? Do you go <laughs> in through the groin? How is it that you get to the clot in the brain to try right, to loosen so things up? Often, um, like Dr. Cruz Flores was saying before, often we get a CTA. Mm -hmm. and that paints the arteries in the neck and the brain, and that gives us an idea where the problem is. So we know uh, we go right there. How do we get there? Uh, there's uh, um, two main routes. The, for ischemic stroke, usually we go through the groin. Uh, okay. These are pipes, um, the femoral, femoral artery, and uh, it's, an, it's a highway system. So we navigate up to the neck uh, with a, 
a main catheter, we call it, and then we go with a <coughs> microcatheter um, mm -hmm. farther in, into the brain. Um, we do sometimes go through the wrist as well. It's a little bit smaller um, artery pipe, but um, smaller clots we can mm. successfully uh, treat through the wrist. Okay. So, so ma mainly through the arteries. And the direction of the highway system, are you using some kind of mechanism to watch that, or do you just know when you get to the clot? I mean, for example, are right. you uh, on an MRI system the entire time, or how, how do you see where no. you're going? So, a very good question. So, so basically, we, um, we have an x-ray machine, mm -hmm. and we use contrast, the same contrast that is used for the CTA. Mm -hmm. And we go and we paint the arteries and memorize the, the map, and we navigate uh, with the help of the x-ray machine. Uh, the wires that we use, the catheters are radiopaque, so we can see them and we can, we use two cameras also because of the um, uh, disposition of the anatomy of the brain. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we don't go into the wrong place. Right. And, and that's how we navigate carefully. But okay, Care I love that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I like how you added carefully. <laughs> um, so once you're there, you're now at the clot. Right. How are you breaking up this clot? Is there some kind of a chemical that's being dispersed from uh, the wire? Are you trying to manually break it up? How, and again carefully, big or small, and maybe think of a, a case study that you've worked on recently and how that works. And on that question too, does a clot ever break away from you before you're able to declot it? I, that's probably the wrong way of asking it, but does that make sense? Yeah, sometimes. Okay. We see the clot on the CTA, mm -hmm. and they get, for example, the clot busting medication intravenously. And uh, when we go there, the clot is not there. It has already uh, dissolved. Uh, but most of the times what we do is we put a, um, a stent. A, it's a stent retriever. Mm -hmm. And basically what it is is a mesh of metal that traps the clot. Mm -hmm. And then we arrest the flow, the anti flow, because the flow is continuously pushing the clot towards the brain, and we pull back the stand retriever grabbing the clot. Mm -hmm. There are other techniques um, like aspiration devices. So right. basically we have large bore catheters that kiss the clot and we connect those to a pump machine mm -hmm. that do a, a vacuum, a negative pressure, and they suck the clot and we take it out. Sometimes we use uh, clot busting medications, mm -hmm. but locally, when it's a smaller clot, usually. But locally yeah. at the end of right the stent? Right there, where okay. the, the clot okay. is. Very nice. I know this is really small, but, and I, if this doesn't work, it doesn't work. This is totally one of those things that acknowledge the obvious type of thing. Um, I'm just gonna put this up. It's a, a picture of the stent. So if we are able to see it, and we may not, but I'll kind of describe it, it is a metal, mesh and the clot that has been retrieved. So this is a real clot. Oh, good job, good job. So this is a real clot that has been taken out of a brain of a stroke. So you can kind of see, I mean, it looks mucousy to us, but it's enough to where other mm -hmm. blood cannot pass through. So the procedure that you're talking about, this is what this is, exactly. is at the end. Yeah. So when you're retrieving this back through the highway system, if you will, through yep. the groin, um, is there a way just to pinch it and keep it out and is there a way to see that you've gotten the entire clot? Yes. If that's... So basically, okay. we, we take pictures. We take pictures um, when we place the, the stent retriever mm -hmm. and we make, make sure that we're grabbing the clot. And, um, and then we wait a little bit, uh, usually, um, and it creates a, a bound, um, the, the clot with the stent retriever, and it's, uh, it facilitates, it theoretically facilitates the retrieval. Uh, once we retrieve uh, the devices, we take, the, take it out of the body, we check to see if we got the clot. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, we do a final run. So we check the blood vessels in the brain to make sure that we have recanalized the, the blood vessels, that the blood vessels are open again. And that's where you see the colors all yeah. going where they're supposed to be at the nice yeah. time. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Cruz, I love that Dr. Cruz is looking for pictures on his phone. If you were 12, <laughs> I'd be mad at you right now. I'm like, dude, get off your phone. No, but I love it. No, no, no. I like it. I like it. Um, so Dr. Veli, then, I'm going to skip you for a second because you're looking for stuff. I like it. Let's talk about a, hem a hemorrhagic stroke. I always have a hard time saying that. So let's talk about a brain bleed, um, something in the brain. I guess, a cl I guess it wouldn't be a clot, it would be a vessel or something. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that and the complete different treatment you would have for that versus an ischemic stroke. Exactly. So 
uh, when there is a rupture of blood vessel, uh, we call this as hemorrhagic stroke, and that could be different types. It could be a spontaneous rupture of a small blood vessel due to uncontrolled hypertension. We call it a, we call it as intracranial hemorrhage, or sometimes the aneurysm can rupture, mm -hmm. and it has a different kind of a name called subarachnoid hemorrhage. So most of the time, it's the problem with the blood vessel. Mm. It could be some kind of a malformation. So the treatment uh, modes are different in each uh, hem hemorrhagic stroke. For example, if it's an intracranial hemorrhage, that's where I come into play, is the patients are housed in the neurocritical care unit to see if there is increase in the size of the hemorrhage, or we try to get down, um, control the swelling around the uh, bleeding. Mm -hmm. We call that as the peri- And the leash. swelling in that situation is a big deal so too, and, right? And we use uh, medications, like we use hypertonic saline, we use like ICP lowering measures of different kinds. And sometimes we may have to call our neurosurgeons. And that's why housing a this kind of patients in a neurocritical unit is so important because mm -hmm. it's a multidisciplinary team where mm -hmm. we have neurointensivists, neurosurgeon, endovascular neurologists, uh, neuroradiologists. So everyone coordinates into patient care and that translates into better outcome. So for example, if there is a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage mm -hmm. and we know by doing the scans like a CT angiogram there is a aneurysm and most of the patients when they rupture there is a big chance that they can again re-bleed in the first 72 hours. So okay. that's why I call my colleagues, hey why don't you just come in and secure the aneurysms and e after that and sometimes uh, we have to watch the patient in the unit because over the period of time after s uh, like from the third day to the 21st day even after the rup after securing the aneurysm the blood vessels may constrict on themselves and what we call as vasospasm hmm. so that's something which needs to be treated and that has different kind of modalities of treatments and sometimes we use uh, like hypertensive therapy like we uh, elevate the blood pressure um, we try to maintain that there is not much of patient stress right. in terms of fevers, controlling the fevers, controlling their electrolytes, uh, controlling their respiration, so on and so forth. And sometimes if uh, things can go to that extent that whatever we do, medical therapy does not help, then we call our endovascular neurologist so that they can go into the vessel again wherever there is a narrowing of the bl blood mm -hmm. vessel they can trickle some medication what we call i8 uh, verapamil therapy mm -hmm. so that can help to dilate the vessel I see. so it's like a constant we need to we need to keep a watch on a patient every hour that's right. why our nurses are subspeciality trained in uh, in neuro so that they can watch what are the signs. So it's more of a multidisciplinary approach mm -hmm. that we uh, uh, we do in neurocritical urine unit for this kind of patients. And that's why it's so nice. And I, I know just going back to the beginning of the program when we had everybody give their titles and what you do, it's a real great team effort. We have quite a few questions here from the audience. This one is a Facebook Live question, and I'm going to ask Dr. Cruz, but it's going directly with what Dr. Uh, Veli was talking about. What are the risks of recurring strokes and uh, the odds of that declining over time? So I'm, it's almost a two-part question. So I know that the original stroke and just those several days and or weeks, that's one part of it. Mm -hmm but let's also talk about years later of recurring strokes. So that's again a question from the audience. Uh, well, let's start by saying stroke begets stroke. Uh, mm. So just like heart attacks beget heart attacks. And so you, you certainly have to work. There are re the reasons to admit a patient to the hospital have to do with number one, do they need to be treated right. uh, with interventions as we just mentioned? Uh, do they have this ability that they cannot move or they, they cannot eat and then the and then the third part of, uh, of the reason to be admitted to the hospital is to actually look for what the cause of the stroke is. A, in generally, sp as a general statement, a, uh, people have just about anywhere between t a 10 and 15% risk of having another stroke within the next year. 
within the next year. Within the so next that's year. really soon. And, okay. the, and, and the risk is higher usually within the first uh, 90 days, if mm -hmm. you will, the, mm -hmm. the first three months. The risk continues to be high up to, to about a year and then starts decreasing. But again, the that's sort of an average. Mm -hmm. of, uh, a, but the risk varies depending on what the condition that is causing actual stroke. For instance, if, uh, if, if, if the reason for the stroke is because the person has a, a very narrow carotid artery, mm -hmm. uh, let's just say in the 90%, then the risk may be higher uh, if it's only treated with medication. And that may require, for instance, to have an operation to clean the artery or to right. put a go endovascular and put a stent to open it up. Okay. Uh, then a, if, if the cause of the stroke, for instance, was atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat that promotes the formation of clots in the heart, uh, that then they can break loose and travel to the brain causing the stroke. Then the risk varies. Uh, I mean, it can be as, as little as 10%, but it can be hi as high as 20%, depending on the presence of other factors like congestive heart failure, mm -hmm. uh, diabetes, age, et cetera. Et cetera. The, the more risk factors, the higher the risk and the setting of atrial fibrillation. And there are some patients that may have just more one than one cause. Right. Uh, carotid stenosis or narrowing of the blood vessel here plus atrial fibrillation. And you, since you cannot pinpoint and say, it was this as opposed to this. You need to treat all all, all the causes. So, a uh, and then a uh, and, and and in general, then you have to treat what we call the risk factors for for vascular disease that are shared with with heart disease. That mm -hmm. is to say, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and so on and so forth. So once somebody has a stroke, they're most likely on several medications throughout, if not much of their life, the rest of their life. And when you said between three months and a year, is that because the body starts healing itself a little bit more after a year after the first stroke? Or what is it that, to it's almost like with cancer, after you get that five year mark. Yeah, well, to, to the extent that the, that the risk factors are controlled, the mm -hmm. risk of having another stroke uh, sort of decrease uh, over, over time. Okay. A, now, if the risk factors are not under control and the person is not taking the medication that are needed to decrease the risk of having another stroke, mm -hmm. then uh, the risk doesn't go too much down. Now, right. the, the, there is imp it's important to know, however, that it's not only about the medications. Uh, certainly medication, th and none of the medications for prevention or for treatment are 100% effective. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about decreasing the risk of, in, in cases of intervention for acute stroke. I mean, uh, in, instead of having a, uh, a, an 80% chance of being disabled, now the, the, the risk goes down. The, the chances for to, to be disabled is maybe 30%. I mean, a, 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 it's not that the, the, the the, the ability of the treatment brings the, the risk down to zero. Same mm -hmm. for prevention. Right. Uh, I don't go from having a 15% if I don't take anything to about 0% mm -hmm. if, I don't, if I take everything. You, you decrease the risk by a certain amount. of uh, You go the, from 15 to about 10. Yeah. Uh, and, and you've got lifestyle choices too that, and that you really have to, factor into like, that. Like uh, exercise mm -hmm. and uh, a, a control the, of the diabetes, decrease right. the intake of salt and so on. Well, this, this show is called Advances and Successes, and this is a unique question from the audience, not something that I'm familiar with. I got him. Sorry. We have had a fly on set. It's been driving us nuts. Um, so now Buzz is dead. So a question here from the audience. A 29-year-old daughter had a left brain stroke due to thrombosis of ovary? She is on blood thinners now, and this person on the line wants to know if this is something that can happen again. I don't know who to give that to. Who wants that one? Dr. Rodriguez, you're giving me the face. <laughs> if you give me a face, that means you get the question. Well, or do you want Dr. Cruz to take it? I, I think Dr. Cruz is the best person. All right, to Dr. Cruz, go for it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to make certain se se several assumptions. And, and you know what? I'm glad that you said that. So, uh, usually so I think about this. So there's so a disclaimer. This is all the information we have. So, so we do the best that we can. It's a 29-year-old female. I, uh, yes. I suspect mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, is, it, it is a, it's a very young person, a uh, very young woman. Uh, with, uh, with a stroke that had uh, uh, a thrombosis and is in blood thinners. If I had to make an, uh, if I had to make an argument about what the type of stroke she had, you see we have, just like in the leg or in the arm or any other system, we have the arteries that take blood from the heart uh, uh, up mm -hmm. to the brain, mm -hmm. and then we, ha we had to have a draining system, right? right? So we have the arteries going up and the, and the veins coming down. One of the most common forms of stroke among women, young women in particular, particularly they have problems with ovaries, either tumors or some, uh, 
tumors or, or problems with the ovary tend to actually uh, uh, make uh, people be more prone to form clots. And in young women, hmm. uh, like in her condition, or uh, uh, late in pregnancy on the first couple of weeks after delivery, uh, they have a tendency to actually clot, but not the artery, the one that he goes fishing at, mm -hmm. but actually the, the vein. vein. Okay. Uh, and so I suspect that if uh, this uh, young lady had a, 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 a vein thrombosis in the, in the brain, uh, that's the reason to actually give her give her a, a a blood thinner. Okay. And the blood thinner probably she's gonna have to take it usually for anywhere between three to six months. Mm -hmm. And after that she can probably come off it. Usually, again, with this little information, I can say it's three to six months, and then probably have a scan like an MRI repeated and see if the, the vein is open. Okay. And then, but the most importantly would, would, would be to try to understand why is it that she had the clot in the first place. Right. And for that she may need once she's off. Uh, blood thinners uh, have uh, more a a blood test to try to establish if she has a condition that actually makes her prone to form clots in their veins. Okay, and clots, and that's something too, because that can get to the heart stroke. Mm -hmm. So I, I have here. I'm trying to organize these questions here from the audience. I have a couple here actually that are related to PTSD, and that's not something that I would think about prior to the show starting. Um, so is that more common, folks that are diagnosed with PTSD? So I'm going to read both of these questions. Uh, why does the brain shut down in PTSD and multitasking become difficult? Is this a function of arteries in any way? Um, another one is a sh the CT showed um, scattered foci diffusely in the white matter. Could this be due to PTSD? So just, just the idea of PTSD and strokes, is that, is that a thing that I'm not aware of? I'm throwing that out. Okay, Dr. Rodriguez, you're the face maker. Well. So, <laughs> That's a tough anyone one. that this loves you knows what I'm saying. I don't know you, but you're, you're the guy that, mm, <coughs> let me think about that. So, I'm throwing no. that question your way. Again, there may not I, be an easy answer. Right. It, it's hard to think of PTSD as a sequel of a stroke, mm. um, an anatomical basis. However, um, a stroke could be stressful enough that could cause PTSD on a patient. Mm -hmm. like any other stressful situation. So, Good point. Um, yes, I mean, you, you, we have patients that um, they're very afraid of suffering a recurrent stroke and, 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 and they have PTSD-like or mm. PTSD mm -hmm. uh, symptoms. But anatomically, I can't think of any structure in the brain. So it would be like the reverse. The lesion could lead to PTSD. I, okay. I don't think there is evidence. Yeah. To, to support a s uh, strong evidence, that is to say. Okay. Uh, to say that PTSD is a cause of the stroke. Now, I think somebody mentioned there white matter scatter uh, mm -hmm. things. Uh, white uh, matter scatter, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I must be, uh, we must be careful in trying to interpret those because typically those white matter things that, that are described there mm -hmm. are typically seen in, in MRIs. Mm -hmm. and now, the MRI is very good at identifying problems, and sometimes you identify problems that, the pers that are not causing a, a problem, right. okay? Mm -hmm. a, a white matter scatters uh, uh, things in the, in the brain may mean a whole bunch of different things. And, and the older population, uh, uh, typically related to high blood pressure or diabetes, it may be related to high blood pressure or diabetes. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, evidence to suggest that uh, that's the cause or, or consequence of, of having PTSD. Okay. Okay. Um, actually Dr. Belli. I want to add, mm -hmm. there is an entity called post-stroke depression. We mm -hmm. generally uh, see in our patients who have uh, disabling uh, strokes, they do go into depression. And that and makes sense. And that actually needs to be treated. Sometimes you need behavioral therapies, or mm -hmm. sometimes even you need s medication for it. Okay. So some because post-stroke depression is an important thing because for a patient after stroke to get better, he needs good rehab. That right. means he needs to have a good willpower. If he is depressed, he may not involve himself into the rehab. The rehab is just like going hitting the gym. Mm -hmm. So. In case if the patient has that kind of symptoms, probably it should be detected first, mm -hmm. early, and it should be properly managed. Well, you hit, I have a question here, but you hit on something beautiful. Let's talk just for a little bit about rehabilitation after a stroke, and I know everybody is different. But just in general, and let's just say this is a person who has lost 
movement function on one side of their their body and anything from speech to being able to see right, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that? So the first thing, whenever I have the patients in the hospital, they ask me this question, mm -hmm. when, when, when I will be better? The, the only answer I give them is how much, how long it will take, I cannot say at this point of time. Right. But one thing I can say, the more you involve yourself in the rehab process, you have a better chance having a functional, good functional outcome. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, in our uh, comprehensive stroke center, we have dedicated rehab team. And the rehab team consists of the physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, right. and also we have the services of case managers, case workers, social workers to actually help mm -hmm. the patient as well as the, as well as the family to choose where they can send the patient for a rehab because it has to be convenient to the family for too. Everybody, so right. it's like a multidisciplinary approach because speech therapy is so important that patients having trouble swallowing. So they have to have some exercises mm -hmm. that, that is taught by the speech. And also, if they have problems with cognition or articulation, speech can help. Right. Physical therapy, I mean, if they, ha they will teach you what are the exercises, so on and so forth. At the same time, they gauge the patient where the patient can go after the discharge, whether mm -hmm. he needs rehab, whether the patient needs home health, so on and so forth. And occupational therapy is important too. Beautifully said. I was S hoping you'd bring so that up. Right. Uh, if a patient has a trouble seeing, mm -hmm. how can he cope up? Mm -hmm. How can he cope up with day-to-day -day activities? So they can teach all those things. So that's why all these things, not only doctors, the nurses, the ancillary staff, the rehab team, and the nurse practitioners, they all work together for a better art. It's a coordinated care. Mm -hmm. That's what we see in a comprehensive And stroke. that's beautifully said too. And I, I know at the beginning of the show, you all said that you don't just teach medical students, but you also teach the entire staff. And when you say teach, it's like, I think everybody's teaching everybody else too. Um, question here from the audience. TBI is what? Traumatic, traumatic brain, brain injury. injury. Okay, so can a traumatic brain injury trigger a stroke is a question from the audience. Dr. Rodriguez, I'm throwing that one your way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, TBI can lead to stroke and usually the mechanism is with a uh, tear of a blood vessel. Okay. Um, uh, and um, the TBI per se can damage the brain in a, in a different way, but it can, it can look like a, like a stroke. So, um, but it can definitely can lead to, a, to an ischemic stroke, for example, or a hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we see um, um, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms develop after a TBI, mm -hmm. and those can rupture, can lead to a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, but also a tear in a blood vessel and uh, blockage of a, of, a, of a blood vessel due to a what we call dissection. So if there's a traumatic stroke. brain injury, um, they would know. And so would there be not a preventative person there, but somebody that's kind of checking things out to see if there might be a possibility of a stroke that could happen the next day or two or week or two when somebody has a traumatic brain injury? Is there a way, I guess either way you would get an MRI or a CAT scan? Yeah. yeah usually uh, TBI patients, they get neuroimage and they get imaging of the brain. Um, but uh, if it is a mild TBI, mm -hmm. they may um, get discharged with a simple CT of a head and uh, potentially there could be a risk of a stroke due to a dissection. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's something to watch um, to see if they have those typical signs and symptoms of, of stroke. So they are definitely at risk of, of stroke. After okay. TBI. A uh, question here from the audience. Uh, Dr. Veli, I'm going to throw this your way. 76-year-old woman with an MRI is showing hardening of the arteries. What medication should she be taking? And is this a perfect storm for a future stroke? So hardening of the artery. Let's talk about, um, I guess, risk factors. We can throw it into that category. So when we talk about risk factors, there are modifiable risk factors. There are some which are not modifiable, like sex or the patients having uh, genetic predisposition. So those, this, but modifiable like hypertension, diabetes, 
lifestyle, so on and so forth. As we age, our arteries, they get hardened and what we technically call as atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens is over the years, there is a plaque buildup. And if it's moderate plaque buildup, you don't have symptoms, but it's only when it becomes severe or critical, mm -hmm. like Dr. Cruz mentioned, if it becomes more than 90%, then sometimes... I'm just visualizing the aortic. Yeah. Uh, um, so when the plaque mm -hmm. happens, one, one type of stroke is the plaque closes on its own mm -hmm. and blocks the blood vessel, or the plaque can rupture and block a distal vessel somewhere and cause a stroke. And that's a good question, like what is the medication she can use? First of all, we need to make sure, like where is the hardening? I mean, is it extracranial in the sense in the neck mm -hmm. arteries mm -hmm. or is it intracranial? So the modes of treatment is different, okay? You may have to use a single agent or sometimes you need to use a double agent or some based on the degree of stenosis or based on the degree of the uh, con the constricted vessel, then we have to choose for interventional procedures. Right. So it's a very broad question, but mm -hmm. ultimately it's, it's from subject to subject is different. That makes sense. Uh, we are kind of at the 12 minute mark right now. So I'm gonna stop questions from the audience and from my paper and Dr. Cruz. Because um, I do still have a lot of, I know that you all have a stroke monitoring unit. I know there's a lot of stuff that we haven't gotten to, and that is the, the beauty and the curse of this show. There's so much that we can talk about. You can have like 18 hours of this. But what is it that we haven't talked about yet this evening that you'd really like to get across to the audience? Well, the collaboration between uh, Texas Tech, the Neurology, and uh, University Medical Center mm -hmm. uh, a led to the uh, creation, if you will, of, uh, of the uh, Comprehensive Stroke Center. Comprehensive Stroke Center is a designation, and there are several entities that actually give the designation. Right. One is the Joint Commission, mm -hmm. which is the most stringent. For uh, to just to, to to give an example, that the DNB doesn't necessarily require to have a, a neuro ICU or somebody sitting in the ICU 24/7. The Joint Commission requires that there is a, 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 a neurologist or a, a neurointensivist 24/7 uh, available in in. in and so what is it that, that, that this collaboration between the, these two entities, the tech and, and UMC brought about is, is the formation of, uh, of, uh, of, of a comprehensive, comprehensive stroke center that has the medical staff, mm -hmm. uh, has a, 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 as trainees and provides education. Uh, uh, the, the Joint Commission requires also uh, the presence of research that is provided by, by, by what right. the, some of what we do there. And then uh, the facilities that are provided, we have the neurointensive care unit and more recently, there's a 10-bed ten, ten uh, unit that, that is actually covered by one of us 24-7 uh, with the help of nurse practitioners and, a, 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 and, and trainees, residents. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and then we have another nine beds that are the stroke monitoring unit, which is uh, a stroke unit. A stroke unit is a, is a, is a place, a, f a physical place, if you will, but it's more than that is a multidisciplinary thing that Dr. Belly was mentioning. Uh, uh, that that uh, creates the environment and, and the team that actually takes care of those patients. From all the interventions that are uh, available, the stroke unit is probably the only one that has uh, proven that, that is helpful for ischemic and for hemorrhagic strokes. Nice. And improving the outcome. And so why? Because it provides that multidisciplinary approach to, 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 to the management of patients. Early mobilization, uh, the involvement of physical therapy, occupational therapy, dietitians, you have the trainees, mm -hmm. uh, you have the nursing uh, that are specialized in taking care of these patients, plus the, the medical and nursing staff uh, uh, that, that, that provides the supervision and care for those patients. And so that's, that's what uh, this collaboration that, uh, that uh, uh, has led to, and, and that's what UMC right now provides to and that's beautiful too and I always think too um, and I'm just the normal Joe that watches medical shows all the time and there's medical students and there's always that brilliant one say oh I just read about this yesterday and this here mm -hmm. so I, I love the idea of the teaming effect of that so I'm, I'm so happy that you uh, explained all that Dr. Veli, is there anything that you'd like to get across or it could be something that we touched base on earlier that we haven't explained fully um, whatever it is that you you'd like to throw out there um. The first thing is uh, 
uh, we in El Paso, we are fortunate to have a dedicated neuro ICU unit which is staffed 24-7 uh, by neuro intensivists. Um, actually, there are not many neuro intensivists across the country. And again, we are fortunate that we have three, me, m myself, Dr. Cruz, and Dr. Priyavat. Um, and it's always exciting because I'm able to work with uh, different individuals from di di different backgrounds like Dr. Rodriguez and his team. So it's always exciting. There is always a intellectual uh, uh, mashup mm. uh, every day. And that is what which excites me. And sometimes I don't know. I go to his room and ask like, hey, I have this case. What do you think? Like, what should I do? I'm an ex, uh, for ex and ex as you know, experience counts. So, so I go up to them and ask and uh, we do research. I mean, that's something that I really like and being in a teaching institute in collaboration with UMC and Texas Tech. And those are very good because in the sense like you are up to date mm -hmm. I mean that actually translates into better patient outcomes absolutely and you'll yeah. be a better teacher so I mean every day I come in there is something to mm -hmm. do so that's what excites me in this field. and there's always something new again when I uh, when I saw the title of the show a while back I saw advancements so dr. Rodriguez I'd like you to uh, talk about something that again something we haven't talked about or something you want to expand on, but then I want the two of you to think about what you see on the horizon. That's always a lovely way to end a show, if that makes sense. Dr. Rodriguez, how about you? Well, I like the, the fact that um, we've been extending the window um, to treat ischemic stroke. You know, we started Nicely with- said, uh, you were talking about time earlier. Right. Okay. Um, um, we started with uh, clot vasting medication given intravenously, short window, three, then we extended that a little bit for a certain population up to four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Then we demonstrated that within six hours, many patients improve um, if, if they're recanalized with interventions. Mm -hmm. But now um, we know that up to 24 hours, certain patients may benefit from recanalization therapies um, if they after 24 hours yeah, if you were to, to say this to 10 years ago yeah, I'd be like that's way right. too late yeah that's good um, so you know the the science has advanced to be able to uh, detect which patients may benefit from uh, this uh, this recanalization therapies mm -hmm. so I think that's beautiful and that's one of the most recent advances in stroke Nice. I'm going to throw out um, a couple of places for you all to uh, look up information, the audience. Again, if you want to watch <coughs> this show again, there's two places you can do that. That's kcostv.org. Find watch, find programs, and you would find this program, the local programs on there. And you can also find it on the El Paso County Medical Society website, and that's epcms. Dot com and if you are a Facebook user you can look up KCOS TV um, and we are streaming live now but I know I've caught the feed several times after that there's also a couple of places uh, Dr. Google is a scary thing and we haven't talked about him but <laughs> leave Dr. Google alone but maybe search engine uh, the American Stroke Association mm -hmm. and this was an excellent point all three doctors said if you have um, if something pops up in your search engine go for the dot org places versus the dot com places dot org usually means it's an organization it's a teaching area um, dot com is usually a business if that helps any there's also the uh, american academy of neurology mm -hmm. um, and so and then the american cancer society not cancer society american heart association oh, is is a place as well so we have about three minutes dr cruz you're a talker dude so i want you <laughs> i want to oh all three of you guys are laughing no, it's not just me, but is there a way that you can kind of laundry list a couple of things that you're excited about what might be happening in the future in the area of stroke? I know that you talked a little bit about saving or having time be of an essence, but. One is the possibility of, uh, importantly, one is uh, the, uh, the emphasis that we should have for, for prevention, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a in, in, in terms of uh, behavioral changes and so on, but treatment also of risk factors. The second is, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that we could treat people after 24 hours, and yet we are. 
a, I, I would think that there may be still uh, some advances in terms of uh, uh, in, in improving or, or, or identifying better those people that mm -hmm. may benefit uh, with, uh, with prolonged uh, a windows. And then uh, the other more important is that in, in, the, in the future is the treatment of intracerebral hemorrhage, which is uh, the, the bleeds in, into the brain tissue, which is still a challenge uh, in terms of uh, finding the magic bullet, if you will, or the, or the silver bullet that can actually make, uh, that's still the, the, the most challenging part of stroke and, uh, that we have right now. So I think advances on that is what uh, in, in the future is what we'll be looking for. So tell me the name of that again. There's hemorrhagic, there's ischemic, and then there's one where the bl blood starts going into the brain tissue. So you have interest, uh, ischemic stroke and then you have a hemorrhagic stroke. Right. In the hemorrhagic stroke you have mostly two types. Okay. One is the subarachnoid hemorrhage that Dr. Veli mentioned. Gotcha. Which is, okay. It's a bleeding into the surface of the brain right. where the aneurysm rupture. And, and then the you're other, talking and about the going other into... The intracerebral hemorrhage which is usually into the brain tissue which is the most common one of the hemorrhages. Gotcha, gotcha. And the okay. most common risk factor for that is high blood pressure. Okay. So try to bring that blood pressure down. Mm. Lose weight and stay on the meds. Dr. Veli, anything that you are excited about? Are you the youngest one on the panel? You look like you are. I, no, I think I so. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, you're the one that's more experienced, which means you're old. That's just a, a beautiful way that the students get to say. Um, but anything that you see, and we've got about a minute, so it's not a lot of time. Okay. Uh, I think we forgot, uh, I mean, for medical students and residents, I think. We, we did, yes. That's a whole other question. I we've got two of them over there. The neuroscience is evolving. In the last decade, it has e evolved tremendously, and it's, there's a lot of hope especially in my field, neurocritical care. I mean, we have doing that brain tissue oxygenation, microdialysis, so on and so forth. I mean, even after stroke, because the first 24 hours is so important mm -hmm. so that we uh, minimize the amount of damage. And the studies have shown, and it's still going on, I think that will be the thing in future that will help. And that's Patient beautiful. Doctor. We have two fourth years here, and uh, Dr. Veli is doing the commercial of trying to get people to specialize in neurology. And you're right, for several years here in El Paso, I feel like there are very few neurologists around. So I love that. Again, you can watch the show again on KCOSTV.org or the El Paso County Medical Society. I want to say thank you so much to UMC for providing this program here. I'm Katherine Berg, and you're watching The El Paso Physician. Good